I'm a person who's known for having a lot of controversial opinions online. Over the course of five years of making videos on YouTube, I've critiqued any number of things, from modern sexual culture to liberalism and democracy itself. Yet for all the videos I've made, as much as I've courted controversy with my political opinions, no statement I've ever made about a controversial topic has ever courted as much anger and hatred as a small little video I made in late 2018 about the book Dune and why it could never be a good movie. Now, to be completely honest, I knew I was courting controversy to a certain extent. Although this video was made three years ago, a new Dune movie, strangely enough, was on the horizon. I also intentionally made the title a little bit clickbaity, knowing that nothing stirs the pot than making a video about a popular science fiction franchise and how it, or its subsequent adaptations in film form, aren't as good as people think they really are. The video itself didn't even largely dwell on the adaptability of Dune or the goodness or badness of its movies. In essence, the theme of my own video was how, in many ways, the narrative and adventure story portion of Dune was at odds with its final theme and perspective on the human condition. This sort of thematic doublespeak is, in my mind, the true strength of the Dune novel and what probably elevates it ultimately to greatness. But at the same time, it's something that cannot very easily be captured in a video format. Film, as a medium in itself, is about the moment and the scene, and as such, has a difficult time capturing multiple layers of things. It thrives best telling stories about complicated human emotions playing out in more straightforward narrative and thematic structures. As I said at the time, this limitation didn't make Dune's central theme and central power completely uncapturable in the medium of film but it made the ultimate project of making a definitive Dune movie so gargantuan that it was virtually out of reach for any type of project I could imagine actually occurring. The end result would have to be both sprawling in scale and totally experimental in direction. Perhaps a miniseries as epic and broad as Game of Thrones, with the same kind of experimental and philosophical flourishes that you'd find in something like Patrick McGowan's The Prisoner. At any rate, not something that I could see ever appearing in a Hollywood movie. And that being said, I thought I had really said my piece on Dune, at least until the new movie came out and I could give a proper review of it. Fast forward now three years and the new Dune movie is a reality, and my own small YouTube video prophesizing that this movie would not, in fact, be good has become my third most popular video I've ever made, and by far my most controversial one. Every week, when I check the comments on my channel, regardless of what new controversy politically I'm involved in, regardless of which community I've pissed off, or what new video about politics I've produced, I can reliably expect that for every one comment on any of my videos disagreeing with me about my radical political stances, there will be three comments telling me that I'm full of shit for not thinking that a Dune movie can be good. And when the movie finally premiered in my own locality, I knew that, regardless of how much time I had for making videos or my scheduling constraints in other regards, I would have to find time to make a follow-up video, to make a review, to definitively answer the question of whether this Dune movie was finally the one that was good, and whether I would have to eat my words as commenter after commenter after commenter constantly said that I would. And now that I finally had a chance to see the film, what did I think about it? Did it capture the essence of Dune the novel? And was it actually good? Well, perhaps I should start from the beginning. As I mentioned at the beginning, the original title of my video, proclaiming that Dune could never be a good movie, was a little bit hyperbolic. Of the previous three Dune movies made, I have found something thoroughly enjoyable about each one of them. I even enjoyed the documentary on Joe Jodorowsky's Dune, one of the most famous films never made. And going into this latest iteration of Dune 2021, I had every reason to be optimistic. The film's previews looked absolutely fantastic, and the director, Denis Villeneuve, was absolutely the right choice for the job. Villeneuve's last movie, Blade Runner 2049, was among my favorite films of the last 10 years, and one of the few recent science fiction movies that I really thought was great. 
If anyone had the patience and I to bring the Dune universe to life, it would be him. So after all of this, going into the theaters, what ultimately did I make of the movie? Well, to be frank, I thoroughly enjoyed it. As expected, the movie was absolutely breathtaking. Every scene seemed to capture the true alien nature of the world that Frank Herbert had created. The sweeping vistas of Arrakis and the all-consuming sand. The strange and alien-looking costumes that seemed to suggest cultures beyond anything we could really comprehend or imagine, and a future world where humanity operated under very different rules than our own. The sandworms, the chief creature feature of the Dune universe, weren't overthought and seemed to hit a pitch-perfect note between being alien and also menacing. No overcomplicated CGI as you saw in the early 2000s Dune miniseries. And overall, the casting and acting of the film was well done. The choice of Timothy Calamay as Paul Atreides was perfect, at least for a young Paul Atreides. And the depictions of the Harkonnens, usually a hard note to hit, was menacing and decadent, while at the same time not stooping to pure body horror the way that the 1984 version of Dune did. Even the most controversial decision in the film to race and gender flip the character of Leet Keens was done fairly well. Although walking into the theaters I had nightmares of a girl boss sassy planetologist, the director seemed to keep everything under control, depicting a race and gender flipped character who still seemed to occupy the role of the wise scientist who had gone native. There was no modern sassiness, feminism, or overconfidence, just the sort of silent stoicism that went along with somebody who must have spent the majority of their time in a patriarchal society. And oddly enough, it was this character that seemed to create the strangest and one of the most surprisingly poignant scenes in the entire film. Although, more on that later. But, all in all, when everything was said and done, Dune 2021 was enjoyable, a good time at the movies, and certainly, imagistically, the closest to how I imagined Dune looking when I first read the book as a young teenager. But is that all there is to say about the movie? Not really. Seeing the movie in a group, both with my wife and a number of other friends, I was able to observe how the film might appear to people who had no previous experience with reading the book or seeing any other previous Dune movies. As I suspected, it wasn't entirely positive. While the movie appeared beautiful, the plot and many of the key motivations of the main characters were completely incomprehensible to somebody who had no idea of what was actually going on behind the scenes. Really, this didn't surprise me, seeing entire chapters packed full of exposition, adapted into scenes with only a few lines of dialogue, all of the intricate details of politics, dual loyalties, and the story of how the Dune universe came to be obviously left on the cutting room floor. The result is a good-looking movie, a movie that knows how to occupy a scene, but not one that really tells a story, not a story that can really stand on its own, and I don't at all blame the director for this. As I originally stated, Dune was just too large to fit into any kind of movie, even a movie divided up into one, two, or three parts. It presents a completely alien world with new scenes and vistas, deep moments of introspection, and an entirely complicated political plot. You can't fit all of those things into a three-hour runtime, and decisions have to be made at some point. Obviously, Denis Villeneuve decided to capture more of the visual aspect of the film, more of the feeling, and I certainly respect that decision. It certainly created a very enjoyable cinematic experience. But leaving the theater, I did have a question in my mind. What was actually communicated? What would an audience actually take from this film, other than having a very beautiful video illustration of a book that they already had read and loved? And it was this question that really centered the ultimate question, the question that kicked off this entire review video, was, or is, 
the 2021 Denis Veneuve Dune movie actually good? This is a question that's very difficult to directly answer, and I should start with saying that I've recently had a big problem finding any modern movie that's come out to be good, whereas as a teenager and even as a college student, I found myself going to the theater very frequently and finding any number of movies that I thought were excellent, revolutionary, and life-changing at this stage, in this particular time period, in this year of our Lord 2021, I'm lucky if I can go to a theater and feel that the movie isn't a direct insult to my character, my moral sensibilities, and even my intelligence. It's not that I'm some kind of cinema snob. It just seems that the kind of thing Hollywood is producing is complete garbage. And the last two decades have not been kind to the indie scene either. Does this mean that there are now many fewer movies that are actually good in some objective sense? What does it even mean for a movie to be good? Going back in time and asking this question to my teenage movie buff self, I think I would have a very ready answer. I would say, in the immortal words of the director Howard Hawks, that a good movie is any film that has three good scenes and no bad ones. For the longest time, this was my formula for cinematic greatness, and you can see how it works. Most good films, most films we truly enjoy, are made of several really outstanding scenes, ones that stick in your memory. It's also a useful metric for films that kind of fall a little short of greatness. Many movies, and here I'm thinking very prominently of movies made by director Christopher Nolan, seem to have any number of good scenes, but are often ruined by bad scenes that really make the movie lag and disrupt the central theme or message. Whereas play-it-safe films like Star Wars Rogue One, while steering clear of any truly cringe moments, never aspire to any greatness because they don't have any poignant or memorable moments that ever make it. And for the majority of my adult life as a moviegoer, this simple rule, the Hawks rule, three good scenes and no bad ones, was my definitive benchmark for whether a movie was good or not. It was simple, easy to remember, and was easy to communicate to people who didn't like thinking about movies at all. And for really stupid heuristics about films, it had a surprising track record at separating the wheat from the chaff, at least better than the Bechtel rule. But somehow, some time after 2016, this rule stopped working. Movies started getting a lot worse, for sure, but somehow even the movies that should have been good, the ones that were well-composed, well-cast, and well-directed, didn't really seem to come together. All the fundamentals were there, they looked really good, they had good actors, they had good scenes, they satisfied the Hawks rule, but they never seemed to really have an impact. They never really seemed to leave a message. And I couldn't really say why. Looking back and trying to fumble around for an explanation is difficult in hindsight, but to illustrate via example, Perhaps I could look at three recent films and trace this phenomenon out. Starting with Denis and Veneuve's original science fiction masterpiece, Blade Runner 2049, going forward to the most recent adaptation film I had seen previously, David Lorry's The Green Knight, and moving finally on to the subject of this video, 2021's Dune. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, there were very few films very few American films, at least, that I've seen since 2016 that have left any kind of impact or that I felt were genuinely good movies. However, I'm very glad to say that Blade Runner 2049 is a very remarkable exception to this trend. Going far beyond the requirement of just escaping from its predecessor's shadow, Blade Runner 2049 really took the next step, painting a bleaker, more personal, and strangely more explicit image of humanity's future, a stifling dystopia where anything that is authentic is crushed under the merciless wheels of technological simulacrum. The film was at once both striking and strangely irrelevant. 
and this is no better illustrated than through Hawk's rule, than through the three best scenes in Blade Runner 2049. First, in the depiction of a strange and bleak relationship between an android and an AI, where it's hard to tell what is manufactured and what is genuine, coming to ultimate culmination in a very strange sex scene where even the physical bodies involved seem like proxies for a digital reality. Second, in the film's description of its antagonist, a strange tech CEO, a narrow-wristed, flimsy-necked bug man who simultaneously seems to have a strange god complex that is weirdly justified. In one memorable scene, this strangely effeminate and also strangely menacing figure seems to straddle the line between some sort of weird, demonic bug man and some kind of all-powerful, all-knowing demiurge. The destiny of mankind itself is being formed in the hands of someone who can't even very easily occupy the body of a man himself. I know a lot of people hated Jared Leto's depiction of this character, finding him not a little silly, but perhaps this was before 2020, when we learned that Jack Dorsey was the reincarnation of Rasputin, and Mark Zuckerberg was planning to put us all in the Matrix. But at any rate, all of this builds up to the third great scene of Blade Runner 2049, when the protagonist himself realizes that his entire narrative arc of rebellion, which the audience has participated in, has been, in many ways, a figment of his imagination, a product given to him by the very corporation he wants to oppose. And through these scenes, Blade Runner does leave us with a very complete and bleak vision and one that goes to the heart of everything we are really dealing with day by day and year by year in this era. It might be a little bit short on catharsis, it might be a little spare on the edification, but the film in these scenes communicates a message that will stick with me for a very long time, and one that I think needs to be heard. And walking away from watching Blade Runner 2049, I knew I'd watch a really good film. But this experience is far from frequent. Case in point, the second film on my list, the 2021 adaptation of The Green Knight. I like this example because it so thoroughly illustrates my problem with a lot of modern movies that are well made. Just looking at the film objectively, it looks beautiful. Every scene is a photograph. The diverse casting, which is a little bit more blatant in this version than usual, is easy to ignore and wasn't too jarring. And following on the Hawks rule, there were multiple scenes that I found to be quite striking. Long vistas of Sir Gwen in the night riding away from the castle into what appeared to be a wasteland. A panoramic shot of the forest that seemed to capture the common theme of memento mori in medieval paintings and literature. A magnificent depiction of the enchanted castle that seemed to capture everything implied by the original 14th century poem. But in all of these scenes, there was a lack of force. It didn't seem like the people acting in these scenes, it didn't seem like the people making these scenes, really actually believed in any of it. But as confusing as this was, one scene in particular tied the problems with this film together. And this scene was the apocryphal edition where Sir Gwain meets and communicates with the deceased but still living St. Winifred. For those less familiar with medieval history, St. Winifred herself, a real person, was one of the early martyrs of the British Isles, a girl decapitated in the 8th century for her refusal to denounce Christ. Revivified in many hagiographies, St. Winifred became a staple in the devotions of medieval churchgoers. And now, here, in the 2021 adaptation, this saint was meeting face-to-face -face with one of the great heraldic knightly heroes of the same medieval period, facing very similar dilemmas. One soul looking back on her own martyrdom and decapitation, and another one looking forward to the inevitability of his own. The scene, which once again never appeared in the original poem, was so full of possibilities. It was so pregnant with meaning that for once I felt that there just had to be something worthwhile to explore here. The director had to have some notion of where this was all going, right? Well, perhaps not. 
I guess I should be grateful, at least the scene was beautiful, but full of meaning, it certainly was not. Here, two of the great heroes of the medieval ages finally meet up together, one living, one dead, one fictional and one real, and what ultimately passes between them, one quibbling, awkward joke and a jump scare involving a disembodied head. Watching this scene was like watching some strange, deracinated American tourist approaching something like the Sistine Chapel or Notre Dame Cathedral. They could see the thing in front of them, they could recognize its majesty, and they had a vague understanding that some kind of reverence needed to be paid to it, but they still didn't know what to do with it. They were never taught how to approach things of true meaning and true beauty, and so they shuffle around with these objects, like an awkward 12-year-old trying to dance with a girl at his first junior high school prom. The strange awkwardness and missing potential of the scene seem to sum up all the problems with the 2021 adaptation of The Green Knight, and to my mind it is this scene that will pretty much condemn the entire film to be a piece of mediocrity at best. But despite that fact, this type of problem is very much on display in most modern well-made films, not the least Denis Villeneuve's 2021 Dune. Now, to be clear, I think the director of Dune is a much more spiritually aware person than any of the people who produced The Green Knight. The movie feels fresher, younger, and less encumbered by strange modernist moral sensibilities. Nevertheless, it's still haunted by the same problem, the same disconnect in meaning and theme. Case in point, a very similar apocryphal scene seems to define, for my own mind, both a promise and ultimate shortcoming of the 2021 film. The scene, coming very close to the end of the movie, depicts the death of the character Liette Keynes in a way that departs significantly from Frank Herbert's narration. Liette Keynes, if you remember, very notably being the character who was race and gender swapped from the original novels, now is also given by the directors quite a different death. Instead of being led out into the desert to be killed by the very planet he, or in this case, she, studied, the character is waylaid by the very imperial troops she was supposed to be serving just before condemning her master's cynical political project before summoning a sandworm to devour them all. The death of this essential character is given a much more action-packed, much more ironic, and much more cathartic flavor as she pounds the collapsing ground beneath her, forming into the jaws of a gigantic sandworm ready to devour the group, friend and enemy alike, the character announces that they serve but one master, Shai Halud. And this is a magnificent scene in many ways, but ultimately lost. The core irony ultimately being harped on in the scene is that the native's word for the sandworm and the native's word for God is one and the same. The rage of the giant sandworm, as well as its promise of enlightenment through the production of spice, is the ultimate double-edged blade of divinity that Frank Herbert centers in his own story of prophecy and history, a core component to the deeper meaning of the Dune series that is very rarely captured or even alluded to in its film adaptations. By summoning her own death in the form of the worm, Leah Keynes is doing more than just seeking personal revenge. She is culling down the wrath of God on her avaricious former masters. The character of Leah Keynes in the book is very much like a John the Baptist or Moses figure, a prophet and guide to their people who leads them further in towards the promised land, but who will never see it themselves. And in this character's final moments, in the movie at least, there is a strange sort of inversion of the parting of the Red Seas, this time as opposed to pushing the water aside to make room for freedom, she's calling the desert in, she's calling down the anger of the heavens to crush those who would seek to manipulate people and wind them around in schemes for their own benefit. All those notions of elites and aristocrats that they can manipulate people that they can control the tides of history, are now cast aside, smashed, the moment the true divinity shows its head. But although this scene did strike me as being potentially great, 
Did it actually connect? Would an audience register what was being said? Did the people who make it actually know what they were saying? On this front, the question became much more complicated. For one thing, it was very obvious that inside a movie, very sparse on both dialogue and explanation, it was virtually impossible that anyone not fully familiar with the books would have really caught the theological irony at the heart of this action. But even for a modern person fully versed in Frank Herbert's novels, or someone watching it the second time with the language explained, what would this analogy even mean? Would part of their allegorical imaginations tap into the symbolism of the entire affair, the story of a bureaucrat turned unlikely prophet, finally casting aside their own shackles, and choosing God over mammon one last time before they drew their last breath? Could a modern audience even recognize this dilemma in their own life and in their own actions? Or was this just another oddity, another beautiful but strange fixture that seemed like it came from another age, and looked at by a modern audience as alien as the strange interplanetary vistas around them, or the bizarre science fiction costumes that the characters wore? And so, was Dune 2021 a good movie? By the Hawks' rule, certainly. It had three good scenes and no bad ones, and in spite of my prediction, it even had a few moments where it attempted to grasp at those hard messages that the original novels tried to communicate, and which I thought would be permanently out of reach in the medium of film. But that being said, I can't overcome the feeling of a certain amount of lacking. As beautiful as the film is, Dune 2021 is incapable of really reaching an audience in the way that it should. It can show them pretty pictures and alien vistas, but it can't really draw them into the world and into the intricate politics and into the psychologies of the characters themselves. Furthermore, the possibility that this movie could communicate the novel's deep perspectives on history, politics, planetology, and theology the kind of messages that I think we need now more than ever, seems for modern audiences completely out of reach. And that is, for myself, more than a little disappointing. Driving home from watching Dune 2021, I imagined how a younger version of myself might have received this movie. The 14-year-old version of me who had just finished the novel, and who was eager to explore all of its strange new ideas and characters in detail. Would the younger version of myself have liked Dune 2021 and found it meaningful? Almost certainly, yes. But strangely, it was a different time. Movies meant more back then, for almost everyone. And now, more than anything else, more than wanting to find an actually good or great movie, what I miss is that experience of going into a theater, seeing a film, and then walking out, and feeling like something had been communicated, not just to me, but to the entire audience. Everyone who had had that experience was now just a tiny bit more enriched, was just a tiny bit more wise, and could go on and live their life in a more authentic and more mature way. And while I know this desire sounds hopelessly naive and idealistic when I relate it here and now on video, I don't think that this experience is at all unusual, even for someone of an advanced age. We live in a uniquely disaffected and disillusioned age, but there are moments and pieces of art that break through that. We can look forward to, and even have the right to expect, moments of true spiritual and artistic catharsis, and we should, as curious and engaged individuals, look forward to this. Still, when it comes to finding good cinema, pieces of art that really hold the promised magnitude of what the Dune novel meant to me as a young man, I'm not sure if we are waiting for a new and transformative filmmaker so much as we are looking to become part of a new and transformed film audience. Either way, it'll be worth the wait.